Turn our Bibles to Psalm chapter 69. And, uh, you know, a little disclaimer. We'll, we'll hear some, I think, similar things that, uh, that may have been talked about, you know, on other Sunday mornings and then Wednesday night in our Bible study in the book of Acts. But I, I feel like when the Lord kind of kind of pounds these things, you know, maybe we need to pay attention to them. But it's also uh, some of the things I'll talk about today is basically our difference from the world and how we are supposed to be different and uh, act different. And I know I talk about that a lot, but as a whole, the church hadn't got it. Uh, so we, we need to understand that we are to be different from those who don't name the, name the name of Jesus Christ. So Psalm chapter 69, verses 1 through 13, if you when you get there, please stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word. Psalm 69, verses 1 through 13. And there will be some similarities from Psalm 22 from last week as well. Psalm 69, 1 through 13. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and praise you again. Lord, this opportunity we have to gather here together, and we pray, Lord, that you'll feed us with your word. Lord, I pray that uh, what is said this morning that is for our edification, our conviction, our encouraging. Lord, whatever it is that you desire, and I pray, Lord, that you'll open up our hearts, our minds, our ears. Lord, that we would receive these things. Lord, help us to be eager to hear your word spoken, not just this morning, but every day. Lord, that we can... Be eager to commune with you and to fellowship with you. And Lord, we just want to thank you most of all for your son Jesus Christ. Lord, he died for our sins and it's who the Bible tells us about. Lord, it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so as David begins this psalm, he's pleading to God to save him, to relieve him from being overwhelmed. Okay, and you may think of that a lot as, hey, I'm, I'm being overwhelmed. Or you may hear people say it, I'm being overwhelmed. And, and David is painting the picture physically of being overwhelmed. When, when he talks about the waters, the floods overflow him. And so he's literally being overwhelmed. He says uh, he's weary of crying, his throat is dried out, probably from wailing, maybe hollering, uh, you know, you may have to read into that a little bit because where it says his throat is dried and he says, mine eyes fail while I wait for my God, is that basically he lost focus on his hope while waiting on his hope. God is our hope and he couldn't, he couldn't focus on that at this time. And so he's overall overwhelmed and weary and that happens to the Christian at times. We're not immune from it. You know, David, a man after God's own heart, was being overwhelmed. And he was suffering. Now we as Christians, we, we do our best not to dwell in it. Okay, that's, that's the difference. We don't kind of wallow in our self-pity or, or however you want to put that. But we grow weary in that we receive resistance from the world and we try to serve God. Uh, we grow weary at times we think we're doing it by ourselves. We think we're alone in trying to do the things for God. And, and David said that himself in verse 20. It says, Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. So he, he, felt, he felt alone. And it just seems 
too much at times. We don't feel like maybe that we're doing any good. Okay, I've tried this ministry. It's not working. People haven't responded. I'm trying to preach the gospel. Nobody's coming to Christ. And so I'm just going to quit. And I, I know of a lot of people who have been like that in our lives. But God says, don't. Don't quit. Galatians 6, 9 tells us, Do not be weary. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And so what's that saying? It's just keep working. Don't be weary. If you're doing good things for the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're doing God's work, you may grow tired, but don't be tired. You know, that, that may not make much sense, but he's saying keep on working. Faint not. Don't stop. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And so we are given this ministry, the fact that we are to preach in season and out of season, the fact that we are to tell people who Jesus Christ is and what He did, that's a ministry given to us by grace. And we have it, we are to faint not. You know, Jesus tells us that we can overcome the world because He overcame the world. We can overcome depression. We can overcome weariness. We can overcome being overwhelmed when it feels like it's too much. And this, this world will try to make us feel overwhelmed. It will try to make us quit. Because we see in verse 4, They that hate me without cause are more than the hairs of my head. Meaning it's great in number. Now we're talking about David's head, not mine. So the greater of the hairs of my head, and then so that they would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. So not only are they many, but they're mighty. These enemies that's coming against David. Now, are these enemies human beings? Maybe that's how they're manifesting. Maybe there's the vessels being used, but we know Ephesians 6.12 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so when we look at that, we have those things coming against us and trying to overwhelm us. We can understand maybe where we may feel weary a little bit, but that's where we've got to keep fighting. As we go on and continue reading in Ephesians 6, it's talking about putting on the armor of God, the whole armor of God, not leaving one piece out because we're not fighting against man. We're fighting against powers, principalities. It's not against flesh and blood. And then we look at the worldly system, and we know 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that Satan is the god of this world. He's blinded the minds of this world. So the people that are not born again are basically vessels for dishonor, as the book of Romans puts it. And Satan and his demons use them to come against us. And we look at how it tempts us, how it tries to distract us, and it gets us from every side. We can't go anywhere without something trying to pull us away from serving God. And it manifests in many forms. It could be like a distraction, or it could be persecution, whatever that may be. And then also in verse 4, he says, They that hate me without a cause. And that's something that we see somewhat regularly in the Psalms. People hate me without cause. And of course, we talked about Psalm 22 last week and how that pointed to Jesus Christ on the cross. And this same phrase points to Jesus Christ as well. If you will turn to John chapter 15, we'll spend a few minutes there. John chapter 15, looking at verses 18 through 25. And this is the scripture when it talks about the world hating us, the world hating Jesus Christ. I think this is the prime scriptures to go to. Now, there's all kinds of places saying that, you know, like what James said, enmity, or enmity with, friendship with the world is enmity with God. You know, here it talks about the world hating God, hating Jesus Christ, and, and why. Now, it says without cause. It's not a good reason, but it's what a lot of people use or what, what it actually is, I guess. But look at John 15, verse 18 verse, through verse 25. It says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. And basically he says, if you acted like everybody else, they would love you. They would respect you. But he says, But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore... The world hated you. So the world doesn't like 
Those who are born-again Christians, why? Because they belong to Jesus Christ. He says, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. And so basically he's saying, Look, if you're following me, you're not going to escape from persecution. You're not going to escape from people coming after you because if they come after me, you are the servant and the servant's not better than the master. The servant's not greater than the master. So if the master is persecuted, the servant will be as well. He says, but all these things, verse 21, they do unto you for my name's sake because they know not him that sent me. And that gets into the reason why they hate Jesus Christ, why they hate his followers because they don't know God. And when we look at the context here, he's talking to his disciples, but they're surrounded by people who claim they know God. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, they, they claim they know God, and they're persecuting the disciples. But yet Jesus is saying, look, they don't know my Father. That's why they hate you. They hate the Son because they don't know the Father. He says, if I had not come and spoken unto them, if they had, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now they had both seen and hated both me and my father. And so what he's saying there is, look, they don't like me because I'm showing them their sin. Again, talking about the Pharisees, when you look about the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, you know, in the synagogue, and, and the Pharisees touting his own self-righteousness, the, the fact that he fasts weekly, and the fact that he hasn't stole money or committed adultery, or all these things that he says he does not do. But yet Jesus has came and showed him what his sin is. And that's why they put him on the cross, because they didn't want to confront it. I know a lot of people that refuse to follow Jesus Christ because that will cause them to confront their sin. It may cause them to confront the fact that they may drink too much. It may cause them to confront the fact that they may lie or that they think that they're a good person and then when they come face to face with the reality, they say, you know what? If I look at God's standards, I'm not good. And so they refuse to confront their sin and that's what happened here. That's why they hated Jesus. That's why the world does not like those who truly, truly follow him because there's a lot of people that try to name his name. It's what Melinda talked about. There, there's all kinds of people. When you look at Matthew chapter 7, it's, Jesus, we did this. Jesus, we did that. And we did it in your name. And Jesus said, depart, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. And then in verse 25 in John 15, but this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. And so again, all this is fulfilling prophecy. John is, is writing what Jesus said. He said, look, it's, it had to happen. It's coming to pass because it's written that they will hate you. They hate me for no cause, for no good reason. And so that just trickles down to his followers. And so their sin was getting exposed, and they didn't like it, and so they hated him without reason. And now back into Psalm 69, you know, David makes mention to God in, in verse 5. He says, O God, thou knowest my foolishness, my sins are not hid from thee. And that's just, you know, it's a statement of fact that, look, God knows our sins. God knows our lives. We can't hide anything from God. And David's acknowledging that. He said, look, you know my wrongdoing. And the reason he's saying that." In verse 6, he says, I don't want people to suffer for my sin. And so as David is getting persecuted, those who align themselves with David is getting persecuted as well. He doesn't want God's people to suffer for something he does wrong. He doesn't want to be a stumbling block. And so to get the picture of that, when we call ourselves a Christian, or say if we call ourselves you know, congr you know members of this congregation, that we worship here with Union Hill Cumberland Presbyterian Church, if somebody in this congregation sins, messes up, however you want to call it, we have to answer for that. Because people ask you, okay, what's the deal with this? You know, let's say, um, you know, if I get caught up, say if I get arrested for DUI, ain't going to happen, I don't drink, but if I get arrested for DUI, there'll be people come to you, so what about this pastor of yours getting pulled over for drunk driving? And that's a shame on you. 
or any other sin that I might get caught in. That's a shame on you as well. And the same is vice versa. And so David is saying he doesn't want his sin to become a reproach to anybody else. Now we know that his sin with Bathsheba, Nathan called him out and said, look, you gave him an occasion for God's enemies to blaspheme him. And we know that later in his life when he commanded the census that God's people suffered for his sin. But at this point in time, he's saying, Lord, I don't want them to suffer and be confounded for my sake. And so if he is suffering, what he's saying, I want to do it for the right reasons. I want to suffer for you. And that's what he acknowledges in verse 7. He says, because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. And so he's saying, look, this suffering that I'm enduring is not for my own sin. It's because I followed God. And so we can put it in today's context. You know, if, say, if I get pulled over for a DUI, it'd be hard for you to answer that. But say if somebody says, I don't know why your preacher's having church with this coronavirus going around. Well, you can take the Bible and defend what I'm doing and be right. It says, God says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves. That we are called to congregate together, to encourage one another, to edify one another. And so, you know, as the world looks down on things like that, especially in this day and time, I've seen all kinds of people, that even that are Christians, try to shame other churches for meeting during this time. I don't know if that's to make them feel better about not going or what have you. But I've seen too many do it. And so David wants to suffer for God's sake. And that way, when there is reproach that comes against him, his people, the people he's aligned with, can answer for it. Okay? And have an answer they, that they're not reproached themselves. Does that make sense? All right, so he wants to... He wants to suffer. If he suffers, he wants it to be for righteousness' sake. And we see that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. He says, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. So if we suffer for God's purposes, we suffer for righteousness, Peter's saying, be happy. You know, it kind of goes to James saying, Count it all joy when you suffer these temptations. He says, Happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so that verse 15 is often used in, in terms of apologetics, that we need to be, answer, be able to answer for our faith. We need to be able to defend our faith. And so when somebody asks you, Why do you believe this? You need to be able to explain it. But also when we look at the context here, when you suffer, you need to be able, if, they, if somebody comes against you, questioning your faith or questioning why you should have faith or even questioning the choices you make because you follow God, you need to be able to answer. This is why I'm going to church. This is why I pray. This is why I give. This is why I fast. He says, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And so those who follow the Bible, those that believe God's Word, especially in the matters of, say, abortion and, and say, home, you know, marriage purity, you know, where people want to legalize homosexual marriage, whatever, you get called names. For one, you, you want to uh, restrict women's rights or you don't want to let people love who they love or whatever. But here's the thing. We can go to the Bible and say, this is why we believe what we believe. And... and I, don't, I shouldn't have to explain any more than that because I follow God. That's what God has written. But it says, For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing. And that's what David was talking about. If I suffer, I want to suffer for following God. And because of his service to the Lord, we see in verse 8 that his brethren has rejected him. He says, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. And this again points to Jesus. We know that in Isaiah 53, 3, it says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised 
and we esteemed him not. And so we know that Jesus was re rejected by his nation, by his people. We know that his family rejected him as well. None of them followed him except maybe his mother as he had his earthly ministry. And as, as a matter of fact, they tried to explain him off as being crazy at one point in time. They told him he was talking out of his head. That's what his brethren were saying about him while he still had his ministry. So he was rejected by them. We know that they followed later on, but at that time he was rejected. He was a stranger to his brethren. And in verse 9 he says, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. And again, this points to Jesus Christ. Because we know that when he cleansed the temple, his disciples recognized and remembered this verse. In John chapter 2, when he did this, it says his disciples remembered that the zeal for thine house has eaten me up. And they, and they associated Jesus Christ, what he was doing, with the Psalm 69. But then the last half of the verse is quoted again. It says, And the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. And Paul uses this in Romans chapter 15. He says when verses 1 through 4, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. And so then Paul writes, For whatever, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And so he's talking about those that have been written before this time, like Psalm 69, were written for our comfort, that we might have hope. And so and I've said this on Wednesday nights, especially when we look at where these prophecies are quoted or these Scriptures are quoted in the New Testament. It's a good commentary on this kind of helps us to understand. And so what Paul is talking about in Romans 15 is bearing the infirmities of the weak. Weeping with those who weep, putting others' needs before ourselves. And so we look in that context, that's what Paul is saying, the reproaches of them have, of that reproach thee have fell on me. And so we take that back to Psalm 69. And David, being a man after God's own heart, was possibly showing mercy to some, showing grace to some, helping some, and he was being reproached for it. You know, there's a lot of people that if you give to somebody that's homeless on the side of the road, they will reproach you for giving to them. So, well, you just wasted ten dollars. Well, how do you mean? Well, they're just going to go spend it on alcohol. Well, that's not on me. That's on them. So, what you do is, if they're saying they need money for food, well, you just go buy them food and skip the middleman. But people get reproached for that. Tell us they're wasting your money. And so we are to follow Christ's example. And that's what Paul was talking about in Romans 15. And he was quoting Psalm 69 here of what David was doing. Bearing, those that, bearing the reproaches of those who have reproached God. That they have fallen on us. And so looking at verses 10 and 12, and this is kind of the meat of what I want to get into, but I won't spend a whole lot of time there. It shows us what David was doing. It says, When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. So he was reproached for fasting. He says, I made sackcloth also my garment and became a proverb to them. And we know that sackcloth is referred to often as when people were mourning. He says, they that sit in the gate speak against me. And those that sat in the gate in, that, in those day and time is, is those who were important within the city. The city leaders would sit at the gate and they would, that's where they would cast their judgments. That's where they do a lot of their business was at the city gate. And so those that sat at the gate spoke against him. And he says, and I was the song of the drunkards, getting made fun of by drunks. And that's what David is talking about. And so David was doing things for God that the world didn't understand. Fasting, putting on sackcloth. And they still don't. Now you can talk to people who are not born again, and you can talk to them about fasting, they can tell you the physical benefits, but they can't understand the spiritual benefits. They'll say if you fast, you get all these toxins out of your system and whatever, but that's not what the Bible's talking about. 
That's you doing without something, afflicting yourself to where you can get more in tune with God, where you can concentrate on what God wants in your life. Or maybe you just need to mourn and repent over some things. And you use fasting to do that. So David wept and fasted, and he was reproached for it because the world didn't understand it. And a lot of times when the world doesn't understand things inside the church, those things become the enemy. They don't understand that... Okay, we believe that the world was created in six days and the world's not millions of years old. And so that gets attacked. It becomes the enemy. They say, I believe science. And they'll preach evolution that requires more faith than believing the Bible. But he was reproached for it, and we get that today even for fasting. I mean, I've had people in the church ask me, not this church, but say they're Christian, ask me what good fasting does besides make you hungry. And that hurts me in the fact that if you call yourself by the name of Jesus Christ, if you read the Bible, you see where fasting is important. You know, and at the time when Jesus had his ministry, he was asked, you know, the disciples of John and the Pharisees, they fast, but your disciples are not. Well, what did he tell them? He said, there's going to come a time when I'm not here, and they'll need to fast. There has come a time where Jesus is not physically here on earth. And his followers need to fast, need to pray. And so a lot of times, people within the church don't understand these spiritual things like this. Well, 1 Corinthians said those that are carnal cannot understand and comprehend these spiritual things. So if they don't understand it, we can question whether or not they're truly in the church. But 1 Corinthians also says that God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God takes the things that the world seems foolish, whether it be practices, whether it be uh, spiritual disciplines, that the world seems foolish. And he even takes people that the world seems foolish and does great things with them. And so we don't need the world to dictate what we do and what we don't do. The world doesn't want us to mourn and repent over our sin, at least what the Bible calls sin. They want you to mourn and repent over other things if they think it's a sin. They, want you, they don't want you to mourn and repent. They want you to embrace your truth. They want you to be what you feel like the flesh wants you to be. They don't want you to seek God's will, but they want you to do what feels good. Fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You know, don't worry about following God. Don't worry about listening to commandments. And even those in the church, they'll say, well, you're just being legalistic. No, I just want to be obedient to what God's Word says. And fasting is not the only thing, but just spiritual practice in general. You know, kind of what the girls was mentioning down here, reading their Bibles. Because here's the thing. A lot of times in the world today, we don't want to have to engage ourselves. So we'll turn on the TV and we'll let that engage for us and entertain us so we don't have to think about anything. We can just sit there or we'll get out our phones and just scroll through and read. And I think we're all guilty of it at some point. And so, you know, a while back I said, look, spiritual discipline takes spiritual discipline. We have to push aside these things because the world would take us, have us to take our eyes off the prize, the high calling of Christ Jesus. So we are to remember, hey, God calls us to fast. We are to pray without ceasing. We are to study God's Word to show ourselves approved. We are to be doers and not just hearers of the Word. Because too often the world distracts us to take, off, take our eyes off that prize. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And so what's that saying? Look, if you're a soldier, especially in this time we're talking about Roman soldiers, you know, they don't entangle themselves with civilian affairs. Your chief goal is to fight for the one who's called you to be a soldier. And if we are soldiers of the Lord, we are soldiers of Jesus Christ, we are to put on the armor of God, let's not entangle ourselves with the affairs of this world. 
And, and that's what you see a lot of times, I think, in a lot of these social justice movements that if people in the church get involved, they're entangling themselves with more of the affairs of the world and they're not preaching the gospel. They're not showing people who Jesus Christ is. He says, he says also, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so when we preach the Bible and when we tell people, I say, look, just because you want to feed the hungry but not tell them about Jesus Christ, that doesn't mean you're doing it right. And then you'll get called uncaring or incompassionate or whatever adjective they want to put to you. But we are to endure that hardness and be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And we know Romans 12, 2 is that scripture, Be not conformed to this world, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so don't be transformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? It's that spiritual practice. Put into practice the things that you know God tells you to do that He implores you to do, He commands you to do, whether it be, like I said, praying or fasting, studying God's Word, doing good for one another. And we give that up a lot of times for what? You know, what, what do we sacrifice to live like the world, to be entertained, to not have to do nothing? Well, we sacrifice our prayer, we sacrifice our reading, we sacrifice our study, our fellowship, whatever it may be. Jesus asked, what's it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So what would we rather have instead of time with God? We're practicing those spiritual disciplines. And a lot of times, if you really think about it, it's something that's absolutely worthless. Or, you know, we may, we may have an ap opportunity to make a little bit more money. So we say, well, I'm not going to read today or I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to pray. I need to get to work. And you'll make a paycheck that you spend it by the time you get it. And then it's gone. And you may have nothing to show for it. Because all those things pass away anyway. But if we truly serve God, we will have enemies. And we see that in Psalm 69. And, and, and when we say that we push back from the world and these worldly systems, people's going to talk about us. You know, they'll call you, you know, Bible thumpers or a religious fanatic. Well, so be it. You know, people ought to think we're a little bit different because we truly follow what God's Word says. We shouldn't be afraid of that. When we have biblical convictions, especially if they're just easily spelled out here in the Bible, we should not ever apologize for that. Never. In the book of Galatians, back again in, in chapter 1, Paul tells them, he says, Look, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So if we did things to please those outside of the church, to please the world, Paul's saying, if I, if I did it for that purpose, if I, if I preached to please you, if I, if I work to please somebody else, if I did anything to please man, I would not be the servant of Christ. We are to serve God. And of course, 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And if we love the world, we're going to neglect the things of God. We'll spend our time doing other things and taking away from those things that we need to be doing, like our prayer, like our fasting, like our studying, like our work, being doers and not just hearers. But in all this, David was suffering and will suffer persecution because as, as the title of this says, the Lord's servant, the world's enemy. People's going to talk about you if you serve God. People's going to come against you if you serve God. But in all that, David didn't find his relief from those who were persecuting him. Because we see in verse 13, But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Though all these people reproach me and come against me, I'm still going to pray to my heavenly Father. 
And then later on in the psalm, in verses 30 through 33, he says, I will praise the name of God with the song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hoofs. So he's saying praising the name of the Lord with the song, magnifying him with thanksgiving is better than any physical sacrifice you can make. And so that's that being that spiritual sacrifice that Romans 12 verse 1 says. It says the humble shall see this and be glad and your heart shall live that seek God. For the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. So if you feel like you're overwhelmed, you're getting weary with the things of this world and trying to serve God, what does David say to do? Praise the Lord. Give Him thanksgiving. Give Him the glory. Give Him the praise and not wallow in your own self-pity or what you think, or how you think things ought to go. And then in Psalm 61, verse 2, He says, From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. And that's what I said David was earlier. He was overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. When I'm overwhelmed, Lord, lead me to Yourself. When I'm overwhelmed, let's go to Jesus Christ. If I begin to be overwhelmed, I want You to lead me to Jesus Christ. If You become overwhelmed, we need to lead You to Jesus Christ. Because that's the only way you get out of these situations. Because you may feel overwhelmed, it's not going to help you any to fuss about it. Turn to Jesus Christ. It's not going to help you any to try to fix it yourself. Turn to Jesus Christ. Because in Him we have all our being. In Jesus Christ is all of who we are if we claim His name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank You and praise You again for this blessed day. And I, I pray that what was said here this morning was glorifying to You. Lord, I pray that it was encouraging and edifying to all those that are here and Lord, I pray that when we see ourselves being overwhelmed that we turn to you, that rock that is higher than we can ever dream about being. And Lord, I, I pray this morning as we sing our invitation, Lord, that, uh, that if we have something that we just need to bring to the altar and pray about, Lord, help us to do it, not to be afraid to do it, not to worry about what people may think if we're coming to the altar or what sin they may presume we've committed, whatever it may be. But Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to be obedient to what you'd have for us and help us to not neglect spiritual disciplines, spiritual practices, whether it be fasting, whether it be prayer, whether it be doing your work. Lord, because you've called us to do greater things than what we could ever do in the world or for the world. Lord, help us to always remember that we are called to preach your gospel and to be the hands and feet of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. All right.